Nice to see you here, bright and early. Thanks so much for, for being here, for being back. After a very intense day and a half of the conference and a very powerful session we had with Dr. Drauzio Varela yesterday. So, you know, thank you again, Dr. Varela, for this very moving and powerful presentation. Uh, so, so we want to continue today. And I think we want to, you know, as we do, keep making connections or finding gaps. But we also want to move to other registers of the discussion about the city and health. So, so this morning, the first panel, we want, to, we want to see how the city and the subject, with its multiple social markers of difference, how, how the city and the subject appear and are reworked on the registers of religion and, uh, and, and, and the media. And I think this will, will take our conversation one step further, the question of visibility and invisibility, right? And the materiality of, uh, of, uh, um, of, of, of people's reworking of themselves and of the city, uh, as they also traverse, consume, ingest, perform, you know, religion and media. So we are deeply, deeply grateful to have a wonderful group of scholars this morning. So we have uh, Miriam Rabelo, from the Universidade Federal da Bahia. And uh, we have John Burdick, who is the department and chair of the anthropology department of Syracuse University. And we have uh, Eloisa Buarque de Almeida, a professor of anthropology at the University of Sao Paulo. And we have our own Gabriela Nuzelis, who will be the discussant. And she is a professor and chair of the department of um, Portuguese and Spanish. No, 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 I'm kidding. <laughs> Spanish and Portuguese <laughs> languages and cultures. Yeah. She always get me, I always say it wrong, and I don't know why. Right? <laughs> this is our only Brazilian Argentinian thing. This is the only one. <laughs> so we are, we are super grateful that you're here, Gabriela, and so she will be the commentator. So without further ado, so we will begin with um, Miriam, John, Elo, and then uh, Gabriela, then we'll open up to discussion conversation. And again, we want to keep our presentations to 20 minutes so we have time to hear the comments and open up the discussion. So thank you again for being here. Video. Hello, good morning, everyone. Um, I'd like, first of all, to thank uh, João and Pedro and Bruno, Lilia and Antonio Sergio, the organizers, for inviting me and for the opportunity of being here. And um, I'll try to be very quick. My paper is called Religion Healing and women's spatial practices in Salvador's poor neighborhoods. Well, in this paper, I want to focus on the trajectories of poor women from the city of Salvador who seek an experiment with religion as a solution for problems related to mental illness. Salvador's poor neighborhoods, um, bairros populares, gather a wide variety of religious groups that offer healing services. Pentecostal churches, houses of Afro-Brazilian religion, Candomblé and Umbanda, there's one and <coughs> another, and spiritist centers, Kardecist centers. I'll start here. Although people seek religious healing for a wide variety of issues, some are seen to be more closely related to the field of religious specialists. Mental illness is one of them. For a few years, I carried out research in a poor and densely populated neighborhood, Bairro, of Salvador, called Nordeste de Amaralina, among women with problems related to mental health, broadly defined in terms of local categories such as nervoso, nerves, juízo fraco, weak judgment, and problema de cabeça, head problems. More than half of the women who took part in the research had resorted to at least one religion in search for healing. All of them sought psychiatric treatment and at least for a period made use of psychiatric medication. In this paper, I will present to the therapeutic itineraries of some of these women and focus on their experiences in the religious groups they approached. It is not my aim to evaluate the efficacy of religious healing for the treatment of mental illness. My goal is far more modest. I want to shed light on some of the possibilities that religious participation opened up for the women I met. Possibilities which, 
were particularly significant in the context of their everyday experiences of coping with illness in the neighborhood. In looking at some of the religious settings where the women were treated, I will focus on the practices that were performed for the recovery of their well-being. I take these practices to be productive in a strong sense. Like any other set of healing practices, they not only bring about changes in a given situation or state of affairs, but also help produce the situation that requires their intervention. And like any set of healing practices, they mobilize many different elements, various objects and techniques, substances, pe other people, words, in order to produce material effects on the bodies and surroundings of their clients or followers. They are thus practices of articulation. The term was proposed by Bruno Latour to refer to the process by which through the help of several material components and artificial settings, a body learns to be affected, becoming sensitive and responsive to more differences in the world. According to Latour, practices of articulation not only produce bodies capable of discerning more differences in the world, but they also produce worlds that are more richly differentiated. Here I argue that an important dimension of, healing, of the healing activities carried out in the Pentecostal uh, and Candomblé groups, the Afro-Brazilian religion, in which, to which the women resorted, had to do with the production of new spatial practices in the bairro, in the neighborhood. The practices by which bodies and spaces were articulated in these settings were also practices that engaged the women in new modes of inhabiting and moving in the neighborhood. Mental illness alters in many significant ways the, the, popular, or the, the landscape of popular neighborhoods, not merely because it transforms the subjective experience from which the neighborhood is perceived by those involved in the daily management of the illness, but because it frequently transforms the way they relate to place and move among places. During our research, women often describe the emergence of their problem as an experience of uncontrolled movement in and out of the neighborhood. Illness disorganized their habitual modes of inhabiting places and living with others. But in their effort to deal with illness or to help those who were ill, some women were motivated to explore new pathways and to discover new possibilities of living together. To understand the ways in which religious practices affect women's everyday lives and movements in the bairro, I will present the trajectories of four women, actually I'll talk only about three today, um, inhabitants of Nordeste de Amaralina. All of them are very poor and most of their everyday activities are set in the bairro. The first one is Hitinha. Hitinha is a black woman of 28. She was born and raised in Nordeste de Amaralina where she now lives with her partner and two small children. She's an initiated member of a local candomblé house at Terreiro. When we first met, Hitinha earned some money from the healing activities of her caboclo spirit. I'll talk a little bit more about that spirit in a while. Hitinha grew up attending houses of candomblé, known as Terreiros, with her mother. When the latter passed away, she was taken in the care of a Pentecostal aunt. Then she started having seizures that prevented her from working. She was hospitalized in a psychiatric institution at the age of 15. A week later, however, thanks to her father's intervention, she was discharged from the hospital. Hitinha's father was convinced that her problem was caused by the African deity, the Orisha, to whom she belonged. Seeking to put an end to Hitinha's misery, he took her to many well-known candomblé houses of Salvador. But it was during a festival held in a small and re relatively unknown terreiro in Nordeste de Amaralina, the neighborhood I'm researching, that Hitinha's orixá, Hitinha's deity, answered to the drums and took possession of her body. Hitinha was initiated in, the, in that terreiro to Obaluae, the Orisha of Sickness and Cure. Here's Obaluai. Um, most commonly associated with skin problems, Obaluai <laughs> is also closely identified with epilepsy. This link is vividly expressed in the spasmodic movements of Obaluai as he dances to the rhythm of the drums. In the Candomblé, <coughs> affliction is one of the ways Orishas, the African date, is demand initiation. 
The arrival of Obaluae and Hitinha's body confirmed her father's suspicion. Her health required that the bonds existing between her and Obaluae be sealed and cultivated. Initiated, she was subjected to both her orisha and to the terreiro, the court house, that mediated their relation. Her first years as a canomblé initiate were very difficult. She had, she had to adjust to a series of new demands, many of which centered on the obligation of coming and remaining, sometimes for days during a week, in the terreiro. As she recalled, she resisted as long as she could. Hitinha tells me she doesn't like to be taken possessed by her orisha. But over the years, she came to develop a very close relation with another class of spirits from the candomblé, who are native Brazilian spirits of Indians, native Brazilian spirits of Indians, cowboys and sailors, known as caboclos. Hitinha's caboclo is a boiadeiro, a cowboy. Um, he's a well-known healer in the neighborhood. And um, Boyadero has his own circle, her caboclo has his own circle of clients. Most of them are women from the bairro, from Nordeste. The caboclo does not charge for his work, but he always receives some token of gratitude from satisfied clients. And he asks for beer. He spends long hours in the afternoon drinking in bars with his friends and flirting. Besides leading a life in the streets, Boyadero displays his dislike for Richinha's children. When working in the medium's house, he clearly, he always demands that they be kept away from him. So I'll make some short comments about this case. We can say that when Obaluae finally descends upon, upon Hichinha, the terreiro produces the object upon which it will subsequently act, <coughs> the relation between Hichinha and her orisha that is made visible thanks to things such as the drums, the players and singers, the festival hall where candomblé rituals are held. The practices that thereby unfold aim at rearranging space to give way to this relation, opening a space for it in Hitinha's body and in the terreiro. They are ritual practices that seat the orisha in Hitinha's head. We'll comment a bit on this, this picture later. That seat the orisha in Hitinha's head and in objects that are caref carefully kept in the terreiro that articulate a body that is sensitive to the demands of the deities and that articulate the terreiro as the concrete material place where the relation between humans and deities is firmly grounded. So this, this picture there is a, a ritual of feeding the head. The, the head is, is taken care of, washed and fed so that it, it is ready to receive the, the orisha. And here we have the, the place where the orishas are seated in stones and kept in, in the terreiro. So we can call these practices as practices of placement, from which the terreiro em emerges as the main direction of det destination of Hitinha's wandering in the bairro as a candomblé initiate. Now, the relation that she later develops with Boiadeiro, with the caboclo, also significantly, significant, significantly alters the way she inhabits the bairro. The practices carried out in the terreiro to reestablish Hitinha's well-being seek not only to create a relation between Hitinha and her orisha, Hitinha and her caboclo, but also to distinguish or separate the fields of action of these interconnected agents. This leads to the production of new places and pathways in the neighborhood, the mediums and the caboclos. Through her boiadeiro, Hitinha engages in a masculine world of drinking, partying, and flirting. Now the second case. Anayusa. Anayusa is a black woman in her 50s who lives in Nordeste de Amaralina with her husband and their three children. Around 10 years ago, she had an attack of nerves triggered by her husband's alcoholism and violent behavior. As she recalls, she ran wild in the streets of the neighborhood. When the neighbors finally caught her, she was taken to a psychiatric hospital. With treatment in a psychiatric op outpatient clinic, Anayusa saw her life unfold in the rhythm imposed by the drugs. She spent, most of her days, she spent most of her days in bed. During the weeks that she was confined to her bed, Anayusa was visited by groups of Pentecostals who came to pray for her health. Responding to their invitation, she attended several services in local congregations and always asked for prayers. Whereas the drugs robbed her of her vitality, she says, the prayers seemed to make her stronger. 
Then she settled at the Igreja Pentecostal Deus é Amor, God is Love. There she was told that only prayer could help her recover her health. To be used by God, to become his instrument, is the goal women seek to achieve through prayer. To pray like a real Christian required of Anayusa the habitual routine exercise of a set of postures and gestures. She says, you can spot a true Christian by the callosity of her knees and elbows, she often repeated. And it called for the cultivation of a disposition of passive surrender to God. It demanded that while praying, Anayusa kept her mind clear of worldly concerns, a difficult task for a woman constantly, constantly afflicted by the daily challenge of raising children in a context of extreme poverty. And that demanded also that she relinquish control over her body in order to be freed and filled and freely used by the Holy Spirit. Her behavior was closely monitored by the pastor and his assistants. Placing herself in God's hands required both the liberation from the world and subjection to the strict discipline of the church. After much effort, she was finally baptized in fire. Filled with the Holy Spirit, she jumped and then cried out loud as her body spinned in a quick, steady motion. As she later described, this was an experience of intense pleasure and power. Through the though the continuous and disciplined exercise of prayer has helped Anayusa break free from worldly habits and places of sin, she strives to spread sacred, sacred power onto the people and places that surround her. She prays over sick relatives and neighbor, and she dedicates most of her free time to evangelization. Every weekend, she walks the streets of the bairro with a group of sisters, Letting herself be used by God, she says, requires that she works hard to spread his word. Now, not much different from Hitinha's case, the illness that afflicted Anayusa and her experiences at the Deus e Amor Church engaged her in new forms of displacement in the neighborhood. Afflicted by nerves, she was caught in a frantic movement along the streets of Nordest. The psychiatric medication kept her stuck at home. Against this tendency towards immobility, the call of her Pentecostal visitors engaged her in, in a movement along the Bahus evangelical churches. The practices carried out in the church to assist Anayusa in the recovery of her health displace attention from her symptoms, focusing instead on the establishment of her relation with an invisible partner, the Holy Spirit. Not unlike the practices performed in the Candomblé houses, they involve measures to awaken this invisible other in Anayusa's body and to fill surrounding space with traces of his presence. Practices of prayer produce a curved body in a position of subjection and surrender, waiting to be liberated and used by the spirit, then finally undone by his power and transformed in his dwelling. All is somewhat displaced or in tension with places where worldly habits are firmly rooted, the body that is articulated through the disciplined exercise of prayer becomes itself a focus for place, the receptacle of a power that can flow to other people and transform their surroundings. Whereas in the candomblé, the building of connections between humans and deities requires material practices aimed at attaching the body to the concrete place of the terreiro, in Pentecostalism, the building of connections with the Holy Spirit we requires practices that disconnect the body from surrounding space. Whereas the pathways trailed by Hitinha are, were, are multiplied through differentiation, hers and the caboclo spatial practices are added but kept different, those of Anayusa are multiplied by intensification, transformed into a conduit for the power of the Holy Spirit. She must maximize the occasions in which she can set this power in motion and make it flow, hence the importance of evangelization. Aimed at spreading the word of God and multiplying its centers, evangelization introduces a experience of walking, of intensive perambulation around the neighborhood at the heart of religious practice. Now, very briefly, a third case. Adelice is a 30-year-old black woman who lives in Nordest with her mother, stepfather, and two brothers. When we met, she was known as the Maluka Meshi Mesh, one of Nordest's most feared mad woman. Meshi Meshi. She moves a lot. Shaking lady. Shaking lady, yeah. 
um, who was always agitated and always on the move, wandering the streets of the bairro, walking into other people's houses and throwing stones at whoever crossed her way. She was big and clumsy, and most thought her manners were masculine. Adelice's mother, Dona Benedita, explored every available alternative to cure her daughter. She accompanied regularly, she accompanied Adelice to a psychiatric outpatient clinic, and through the years took her to eight candomblé houses, one Pentecostal church, and one Cardassi center. Recourse to religious healing did not imply abandonment of treatment with doctors. Benedita, the mother, did her best to assure that Lisi took her medication regularly. But the latter's constant outings made it difficult for her to guarantee the doctor's prescriptions were followed. Adelice did not appreciate the effects the drugs had on her. She felt she lost her initiative and became too slow and drowsy. Benedita found no improvement in Adelice's behavior. Tired of so, ma so many failed attempts to see her daughter recover, she gave up her search and limited her intervention to administering uh, Adelice's medication. Around that time, she was visited by a group of women that invited, that invited her to attend a nearby temple of the Assemblea de Deus, the Assembly of God. She liked the services and the songs captivated her. With Benedita's permission, the women came by every day to accompany Adelice to the church. She was later baptized and became a regular member of the Assemblea de Deus. The practices of modesty cultivated in the church and which the women tried to teach Adelice impose a measure of restraint, restraint onto the latter's agitated body and enable the girl with masculine <coughs> manners to finally present herself as a Christian woman, a woman, a Christian woman. Adelice tries her best to fit in and is pleased to see how people respond to her transformation. She likes being invited to the house of her new sisters and above all, she loves accompanying other members of the church in long walks in the bairro. She still spends most of her day out, but the walking practices have undergone an important change. They are now practices of evangelization. As we can see, the Assemblea de Deus focused on gradually transforming Andalis into a Christian woman. This involved two interrelated set of practices. The first are practices that articulate her body by adding to it objects such as the Bible, modest clothes, a hymn book, things that not only exhibit her new identity, but that help her gradually adjust to this identity, that make certain demands on her or her demeanor. The second are practices that articulate Adelice's surroundings as places and pathways defined by the presence of her Assemblea sisters. They accompany her to the church, she spends time at their house, and walks in their company to the house of unknown neighbors. And thus, they are practices that trans transform Adelice's wanderings into itineraries of evangelization. Now concluding the remarks. In this paper, I looked at the trajectories of four women, inhabitants of Salvador's poor neighborhoods, who were afflicted by mental illness and re who resorted to religion in search for healing. The practices that were performed in the Terreiros de Candomblé and Pentecostal churches we examined sought to regulate, redirect, nourish, and or ground relations which they made visible in the sufferer's body and in her surroundings through the help of many different elements, either by connecting symptoms to the actions of invisible others or simply by turning attention away from symptoms and investing in the creation of new protective bonds, these practices moved with more or less success toward disconnecting illness from the sufferer. Their effect in this sense was quite the opposite of the one typically achieved by biomedical practices of diagnosis and treatment. Instead of producing disease in the body, they articulated bodies that were sensitive and responsive to invisible others, orishas, caboclos, the Holy Spirit, God, who made regular demands on them. And in so doing, they produced new forms of inhabiting and moving in the neighborhood. The activities carried out in the churches and tejeros briefly described here engaged the women in new spatial practices that were particularly significant in the context of their everyday experiences of illness. Whereas medication was usually said to weaken or interrupt movement, keeping women stuck at home, religious practices multiplied their forms and possibilities of movement in the bairro. When the connections crafted in religious settings were strong enough and able to reach wide enough, they helped articulate worlds where women's ordinary walking practices could be diversified through the addition of the walking practices of their spirits 
or intensified through the power of the Holy Spirit. In any case, worlds where the task of being a woman could be performed through the exploration of new pathways and places. Thank you. So I also would like to join others in thanking João and Pedro for this wonderful opportunity. And I've learned an enormous amount and met new people. And I guess that's exactly what a conference is supposed to do. So I'm, I'm thrilled by that. Uh, I'm also very honored to be one of the few non-Brazilians to comment on Brazil. Uh, this is putting enormous pressure on me and Alexander, but I think that it's appropriate. To, that this, this historical conjuncture, we need to be reversing the, the, the arrows of, of uh, the politics of knowledge, and so I'm thrilled to be part of that. Um, my comments are about race, about cities, about a city, about religion, about gender. Uh, they are about health, but in ways that I'm not sure that I understand, and I hope you'll, you'll help me understand how, that, how they're about health as well. Um, despite over 30 years of sustained black movement activism, deeply racist ideas are alive and well in Brazil. These include the notion that racism is a North American, not a Brazilian problem, that slavery in Brazil was less oppressive than it was in the United States, that Africa is an uncivilized continent, and that activism about race is corrosive of Brazilian national identity. Evangelical Protestants, and I'm not disaggregating that phrase for now, uh, we can do that during the question and answer, still among the fastest growing religious groups in the country, are in general of little help in the struggle to dismantle such ideas. Even when they don't embrace the ideas themselves, evangelicals usually have little interest in black identity and anti-racism politics, believing as they do that, all, that as saved Christians, uh, they already enjoy full equality before God, that the individual soul is more important than any this-worldly collective identity, and perhaps the biggest ideological bottleneck of all, that the religion so dear to the anti-racist struggle, Candomblé, is a playground of the devil. Yet at the same time, the past two decades have seen the growth among Brazilian evangelicals of the Musica Negra movement, including the genres of black gospel, happy gospel, and samba gospel. And uh, I have a book that has just come out, which is an effort to compare these three musical scenes. It's called The Color of Sound, and some of these comments are drawn from, from this work. Uh, São Paulo is the epicenter of this movement. The last time that I counted, uh, there were more than 20 major black gospel choirs, corais, in the city, including Raiz Coral, uh, 200 amateur and professional Christian rap groups, and dozens of gospel samba groups. Over the past decade, I have examined whether and the extent to which this musical movement may be pushing back against evangelicalism's generally suspicious stance toward <coughs> black identity and anti-racism politics by reconfiguring black identity. In striving to understand the relationship between gospel music and black identity in evangelical churches, I've paid special attention to the role of gender. This paper argues that while male and female black Christian singers do indeed push back against their church's general rejection of black identity politics, they do so in subtly different ways, ways that have political consequences. Let me begin with Priscilla, a self-identified negra in her early 30s, the lead vocalist uh, in Villa Matilde's Church of God in Christ. And all of the people I'll be referring to here Actually, the, the sample includes working class, lower middle class, middle class, so I'll, the, uh, Priscilla's lower middle class, and we can talk about what that means during Q&A. 
Priscilla experiences singing as an inner spiritual battle, the devil always at her doorstep. The devil, she said, knows the power of gospel music. We singers are his worst enemies. His goal is to break our will. What I hear in her singing, she says, is the sound of a soul engaged in life or death, hand-to-hand -hand combat with the enemy of God. She points at the CD player on her dining room table playing Kirk Franklin something about the name of Jesus. That song, she says, is armor for me when I go into battle. I hear the singer's voice, in the singer's voice, something that makes me ready to do battle. We listen to Delon Collins' voice belting out the line, it's just like fire shut up in my bones. The Holy Ghost is moving and just won't leave me alone. Along with the ache, Collins' voice is filled with ferocity, as if he were engaged in gladiatorial combat. Priscilla presses her lips together and closes her eyes. I hear a force of power, a supernatural force, because the singer is engaged in a spiritual war. That is what I go through when I sing. It is a very deep war, John. When I sing, I'm fighting. When I sing, I confront the devil. When I sing, I'm in a battle. When I sing, I feel the devil is near. I can feel him. How do you feel him? Asks the anthropologist. <laughs> I hear his voice. When I'm about to sing at the start, I start to sing, I hear a little voice trying to plant doubts in my mind about my right to sing before the multitudes. He speaks to me about the past, about the bad things I've done. He says, Priscilla, why do you think you can ascend the pulpit and minister with all you have done? He makes me think, who am I to do this? He says to me, ha! They're making fun of you, Priscilla. They're looking at you and they, and they think you're drunk. They think you're crazy. Ha! Why do you think you can sing to them? That's what I hear at first. It is the devil trying to plant an inferiority complex in my brain. Priscilla then proceeded to tell me some of the things the devil reminds her of, that she was tempted in the past, felt lust, and greed and jealousy. She slept with men she shouldn't have, did not always walk in the ways of the Lord. Worst, she had felt moments of pride in her own voice. There are times, yes, that I was singing. I began to feel that pride in being listened to, replacing pleasure in God with pleasure in myself. So I asked, what happens next? She smiles. I can hear the devil's words. I can feel his hot breath. When I feel him near, I draw down God's power so that I can battle him directly. That's when I need the Holy Spirit, because all alone I cannot face the devil. The only way I can survive is by drawing down the power of the Holy Spirit. Anthropologist, I, how do you do that? To draw it down... To let it fill me up, I must rip myself apart, to break my heart open. With these surprisingly violent words, she places two fingers gently on the V of her blouse, right below the collarbone. I must rip myself in two, right here at the bone, digging down to a place deep inside my heart. When I do that, the spirit enters. When faced with the spirit, the devil cannot remain. And so I feel a welling up of joy as the devil slinks away and I sing with even greater joy because the Holy Spirit has won. As Priscilla spoke, she clenched her fists and started to spar against an invisible opponent. With all this talk of bones ripping and digging, she sounded like a prize fighter down but not out, climbing back up, adrenaline rushing to deliver a knockout blow. Now, I want to suggest that this interiorization of the spiritual battle is gendered, an effect of discourses that teach Brazilian women in general and female Christians in particular 
to regard themselves as unworthy of standing before the multitudes. In the churches I spent time in, women performed roles as evangelists, prayer leaders, and Bible study teachers, but only men could become pastors and preachers. This was justified by the epistle to the Ephesians, in which Paul states that God has ordained men to lead women. And in fact, many of the women I got to know stated clearly their view that God wanted men to be the leaders, both in church and at home. This reading of the Bible shapes how women think of themselves when they ascend the pulpit to sing. When I stand before the church, said Martha, a singer in her 20s, I am full of doubt. For a full minute I hear the voice of the devil. Yet these same women believe that if they sang with sincerity, God would move within them. Thus, for women in evangelical churches, the experience of standing before the congregation can be a deeply tense one between their religiously ingrained self-suspicion and their conviction that God is moving within them. They experience within their bodies a collision between these two forces. It is a deep battle within me, Martha said. At the start, I don't believe I should stand there, a sinful, imperfect vessel. So I close my eyes when I'm up there. I'm so shy that I just can't stand to look at everybody looking at me. The devil rings my heart. It's like a pain in my heart. But then the spirit comes and gives me the victory. The gendered nature of the experience of inner spiritual combat became clear to me when I asked men to describe their experience of singing. Of the 20 male singers I interviewed, only two spoke of collisions within their souls. More commonly, they spoke of spiritual battle as happening to others, as external assaults upon the church, rather than a struggle within their own hearts and minds. They did not describe an interior process. They spoke rather of an external battle between, on the one side, them, as vessels of the Holy Spirit, and on the other, the devil. They painted themselves as fearless guardians of the church, standing up against a force that penetrated the congregation from without and circulated in search of the church's weakest members. When I stand before the church, explained Sergio, I feel the Holy Spirit speaking to me. Sergio, now is the time to fight against the enemy. Look out across this church. The enemy is haunting this place. He has wandered in from the street. He is doing the rounds, tempting the souls of these people. Here, the devil is stranger. He is a con man who has wandered off the street. Gone is the image of intimate whispering into the singer's ear. Nothing about this picture raises questions about the male singer's right to stand before the multitudes. Nothing about it evokes an inner wrestling match with self-doubt. We are in the presence of a full-scale ethos of masculine self-assurance. Male singers told me they arrived on stage strong in the spirit and launched right away into their singing. Mariano looked at me quizzically when I asked whether the devil ever bothered him when he began to sing. No. Anointed by God, the devil cannot touch me. He comes to the church to trouble souls among the multitudes. When I sing, that chases the devil away. Now you'll see in a moment why I've gone into this, into this uh, detail, because it's only through understanding the, the spiritual battle that I think we can understand everything else about what happens in evangelical churches, but certainly about singing. Let me now turn from how gender shapes the experience of spiritual warfare to how gendered ideas shape black gospel singers' understandings of God's plan for a voz do negro. With a consistency and fervor I found astonishing, both male and female black gospel singers told me that God had entrusted to negros the special, distinctive, world historical mission of using their rich, vibrant, inimitable voices to bring humanity to salvation. All of my informants, both male and female, insisted passionately 
that the most powerful singing voices in the world, voices that had the power to penetrate into the very marrow of the human soul, rip the human heart in two, flush listeners clean, and cause them to cry out for Jesus, belonged without a flicker of doubt to black people. I'm not saying that Brancos can't develop their voices, said Priscilla. Podem. But it's obvious. For this kind of singing, negros have better timber. They are capable of expressing more. Douglas, a working class black gospel singer, echoed the view. In a really good choir in church, he explained, maybe you have a few brancos. But they're not the lead singers. You look around, and who are the artists who really stand out? Silveira, <clears throat> Robson Nascimento, Sergio Sass, Daniel, Tom Carfi, all negros. <coughs> now, of course, the association between blackness and singing is enmeshed in four centuries of slavery and oppression, as in the United States and as in Brazil. As Ronald Rodano and others remind us, the attribution to blacks of fine singing voices is the legacy of centuries of racist ideas, such as slave masters' interest to paint a picture of slaves as contented with their lot, as well as the rendering of African and Afro-descended cultural practices as natural and based in bodies. But, it is also the res a result, as Paul Gilroy and others have taught us, of the African diaspora's deployment of voice as a part of the body, as a source of survival, coping, resistance, and identity. Whatever the ultimate sources of this complex clustering of stereotype, fantasy, practice, vision, racist belief, and racial pride, there is no denying that it is alive and well among black gospel singers in Brazil. The question I wish to focus on here is how female and male singers understand this cluster of ideas and practices in specifically gendered ways. Let me begin with the female black gospel singers. When they explained what they saw as the special exclusive power of black voices, they tended to articulate a narrative of collective suffering and overcoming. Negros bring their suffering into every note they sing, said Priscilla. Listen, really listen, and you can hear in the voice, da, a voz do negro, something unique. We sing with this emotion because we have suffered much in the past, and we still suffer. We endured slavery, and we are still discriminated against today. So you hear all of that in the voz do negro. We have a sadness that white people will never know, but they can hear it in our voices. Priscilla told me that, as I have learned about our people's history, I have concluded that God made us so that people can always hear a lagrima in our voices. I think that negros are the only ones who have the sound of weeping in their voices, the sound of pain, in their voices. The negro with his history, even today we still suffer. So when we enter truly in the Lord, we offer our voices to the Lord, a voice full of pain and ripped apart. Now though Priscilla's account might be fairly standard among US black evangelicals, in Brazil it represents a departure from the still tenacious and widespread denial of deep Afro-Brazilian suffering. It is important to recognize this departure, coming as it does from a deeply committed evangelical Protestant, someone who participates in a religion that in general regards as uh, any overly strong interest in racial identity as a sign of spiritual immaturity. Yet here we have Priscilla expounding on the world historical meaning of black suffering. Yet it is a complex paradoxical expounding hard perhaps to be understood fully by those who do not share Priscilla's theological worldview. Listen, for example, to her commentary on the diary of a slave woman. Uh, the US slave narrative by Harriet Jacobs, 
which a friend had given her to read. There in that book, Priscilla said, this woman says that singing was what they had. They could not cry out against their oppression in any other way, but they could sing. I think that is what God had in store for us. He needed us to sing, to express our pain in that way, because he knew that this would cut through the heart to the hearts of listeners. Not that God planned that we would be enslaved. That is the evil of man. That is sin. That is free will. But God is all powerful. He sees and uses all to the benefit of all. He uses the benefit in everything. God needed the tears that we shed. He needed the tears in our voices. He needed our brokenness. He needed the sadness in our voices. He needed this because this feeling of brokenness when we sing touches the hearts of man. So you see, negatives are part of the will of God for humankind. Our voices are his instrument to reach humanity. It is through us that God saves the world. This is our anointing. This is our destiny. This is also, of course, a very difficult view for anyone who does not see the will and design of God in the fall of every leaf, as Priscilla does. Uncomfortably, perhaps, for some of us, Priscilla is here portraying the history of black suffering as itself ultimately part of divine design. In her recounting, it was the history of enslavement and oppression that ensured that black singing voices would have the power to touch the deepest parts of listeners' souls. I heard this point of view expressed in one way or another by most of my female interviewees. I'm going to skip over a little bit here. Now, I will... I also found that uh, this view went hand in hand with celebration of black refusal, rebellion, and resistance. The image of the rebellious North American black was central for many of these women. Priscilla, for example, explained that the book she was reading about slaves in the United States brings us very, a very important lesson. In your country, Negros wanted to change history, and they did it with this strength, this force, and it was this force that their throats put forward. They really fought for themselves. The slaves in the United States refused to lower their heads. They refused to give up. They wanted to figure out how we are going to change our history, and they did it through their voices. And song was a very strong expression for the slaves. It was like they were saying to their masters, OK, you can beat me, but I'm going to sing. Now, the male black gospel singers, I got to know, accepted the narrative that black voices derived their world historical power, their power to save souls, from a history of this worldly suffering. Yet, and this is the key point I want to underline, their emphasis was elsewhere. When I asked them to talk about God's plan for black voices, they would eventually get around to the history of suffering. But they did not begin with it. Instead, they would always start by drawing my attention to a series of Old Testament prophecies that God planned to call upon a strong, brave, powerful people from Africa to offer their gifts to the world. I heard this idea for the first time from the famous black gospel singer Sergio Sass of, of High School on stage in front of thousands of fans. As he ended a set, he opened the, his Bible to the book of Isaiah. My friends, he said, the 18th chapter of Isaiah speaks of a people from a land beyond the rivers, from Ethiopia. Listen to the seventh verse. In that time, a gift shall be brought unto the Lord of hosts by a people tall and of glossy skin, from a people terrible from their beginning onward, a nation that is sturdy and treadeth down, whose land the rivers divide to the place of a name of the Lord of hosts. Do you see? It is a prophecy. The black race is fulfilling the prophecy. It began with the Americans because they followed Jesus before we did. They filled their churches with praise before we did. But now we are, going, we are doing it too. Now is our moment. Now it is our turn, Brazilians. Through our song, our voices in song, we are delivering souls to the Lord. 
He has endowed us with the most beautiful, powerful singing voices in the world in order to fulfill prophecy so that we may convert the masses throughout the world. Later, when I asked male black gospel singers to explain what it was that God had done to endow their voices with such qualities, they emphasized not histories of suffering, but rather their voices' physical features and prowess. Indeed, they embraced what I can only characterize as a bioracially bio deterministic view of their voices. The black has natural resistance or strength in his voice, Serge Josas announced to me. His throat muscles are stronger, more numerous, more resistant than any other race. There was no mistaking his pride when he said this. We have the strongest voices in the world. Others would love to have the strength of our voices, but they can't. They just don't have the equipment that we do. God gave us this so that we could fulfill his prophecy. He sometimes referred to the black voice as a Cadillac. I'm coming to the end here. <clears throat> now, in some sense, at a deep social level, Sergio and other male black gospel singers were no doubt appropriating the racist bio-essentialization of their voices and flipping it, transforming it into a source of power and pride. Thus, when Sergio and the others, the others said that God had bestowed upon them a vocal apparatus that was strong, sinewy, and well-suited to the strenuous demands of belting, one of the key singing skills of black gospel as a genre, they surely were engaging in what Ronald Rodano calls socio-political jujitsu, the racist narrative that depicts blacks as enjoying a natural musical endowment, he writes, has periodically served blacks in paradoxical ways as a source of identity and pride. To classify music as God-given inscribes it as a possession beyond the grasp of whites. Accordingly, it offers performers and insiders a powerful tool for inventing an exalted racialized space. To conclude, I cannot claim to understand fully why male black gospel singers, in explaining how God used their voices to bring about the redemption of humankind, emphasized physical vigor and strength rather than collective suffering. Perhaps, as with the male view about spiritual warfare, ideas about natural vocal prowess are quite simply one more manifestation of the ethos of hypermasculinity. Uh, it is surely no accident that the men I spoke with took pride in describing their vocal apparatuses as they might other parts of their bodies, as muscular, large, resilient, and thick. They seem to downplay, meanwhile, the narrative that highlighted weakness, suffering, vulnerability, and the paradoxical quality of God's will. Instead, by emphasizing the natural endowment of the black voice, they seem to be thematizing their own strength, toughness, invulnerability, and God's will as clear and unparadoxical. In contrast, the female singers I got to know were more comfortable and interested in a narrative of suffering and overcoming in the context of a kind of divine tragedy, perhaps mirroring their own experience of the world. In the last paragraph, I'm, I'm skipping a section where I talk about the political consequences of this. We can perhaps discuss that. I hope that the views I have brought to the surface today allow us to complicate the assumption that there is no serious thinking among evangelical Protestants about race, racism, and blackness. I also hope it has shown that we must always look closely at the difference gender makes and consider the subtle, intersectional ways gender shapes modes of thought and action about racial identity and struggles for racial justice. Thank you. Well, I want to thank the organizers, Lili, João, uh, Antonio Sérgio, Bruno, Pedro, and Marcelo as well, for the opportunity to be here. I'm going to talk about tele Brazilian television, and I'll, I'll get into health as well. <laughs> Brazilian television has mirrored Hollywood classic, Hollywood's classic vertical mode of production. Networks both produce and broadcast. During the 1970s, Hedge Global, currently and still the most important TV and hegemonic TV network in Brazil, 
developed an effective cultural industry, rely on capital coming from advertising, both from private and public companies. It monopolized most of the audience throughout the country during the 1970s, 80s, and 90s, and therefore had the largest, and still have, the largest revenues in advertising when compared to other media in the country. Global relied on a company model which negotiated with the dictatorship and hired professionals from advertising and marketing. Throughout the 70s, Global kept an average of 70% share of the audience, even though not everybody in the country had TV sets. As a commercial TV network, Global played an important role in the constitution of a consumer market in Brazil. That's central in the argument. It based its programming on a prime time mix of telenovelas and news. I will use the word telenovela here instead of soap opera because telenovela is a somewhat different format, okay? It takes seven to nine months. It's a prime time show. It's not a daytime show. Um, telenovelas focused on urban middle class and upper middle class women as the ideal audience, being associated with the expansion of the consumer market. Until the, t until the 21st century, telenovelas have been a shared cultural repertoire and Globus hegemony was undeniable. During the 70s, under censorship, most telenovelas focused on subjects related to Brazil's process of modernization as the background for love stories, family conflicts, and emotional plots. Telenovelas on the t 10 p.m. slot geared to towards upper class and more educated audiences um, relied on indirect social and political criticism being written by well-known communists such as D Dias Gomes. The main news program, Jornal Nacional, uh, National News, openly supported the government and thus guaranteed a good relationship between TV Globo and the government and dictatorship. Such good relations also guaranteed protection for Globus communists, trying to show for Globus communists, I mean, all, Communists who worked at Global had protection during dictatorship. Trying to show this modernizing process, telenovelas focused on white, middle, and upper urban classes, and women's stories center on ideas of romantic love as self-realization. Taking into consideration the changing mores of society, telenovela, especially those written by Jeanette Eclair, an important author in that period, also showed and valued working women or women seeking a career. Since the 1970s, and even more clearly in the 80s, Brazilian telenovelas were well known for constituting a somewhat distinct genre when compared to other Latin American telenovelas. Seen as less melodramatic and more realistic, they aim at discussing social transformations behind love stories. This meant representing larger issues on TV, such as the process of modernization, migration, as well as discussing political themes directly or indirectly with censorship operating until 1988 within a melodramatic framework. The focus on dramas that could produce a social portrait of the country and its economic transformations, as well as the need to attract and keep advertisers, took Hedge Global to produce shows such as Malu Mulher, on the air between 1979 and 1980 at the 10 p.m. slot. Malu Mulher focused on feminist ideas of work as emancipating and sexual liberation, particularly heterosexual. Target towards urban middle-class working women, the heroine was a 33-year-old sociologist getting a divorce <laughs> with a daughter to take care of. Separation was the happy ending of the first episode, thus inverting the formula of telenovelas where marriage was the main happy ending, as you know. Malou wants to free herself from a marriage that does not satisf satisfy her, that seems to be false. And therefore, these TV shows meant to attract an audience that was questioning women's roles in society. Malou Mulher also told stories about different women, mostly middle and upper class housewives, but also unhappy wives and mothers of all social classes, as well as working women and maids. At the same time, it fought against sexual moralism, sexism, racism, 
prejudice against homosexuals, against the disabled, the aging, and so on. It also discussed themes that were considered taboo, such as abortion, still considered taboo. Domestic violence, police violence, and indirectly criticized dictatorship. Written under official censorship, some issues were openly discussed while others were just hinted at. Surprisingly, one episode in which the main character openly supported the legalization of abortion was approved by military censorship and faced such a polemic reception that Global TV never again tried to discuss such an issue in their such liberal light. Summing up, the main themes were marriage, female autonomy, and sexuality. Those were also central issues in the agenda of the feminist movement in the period. 1975 was the United Nations Women's International Year, and from then on, the feminist move movement gained momentum in Brazil. This series had a clear pedagogy of the independent woman in its messages. The story stressed the value of female autonomy, sorry, sexuality, pleasure, and the search for new conjugal and family relationships in a more reflexive manner than telenovelas. Nevertheless, such feminist discourses were expounded by Regina Duarte, an, act an actress nicknamed Brazil's sweetheart, Namoradinha do Brasil. Because her public persona was that of a good, gentle, virginal young woman, and which is why I put those images over there. <laughs> the image of the sweet girl next door made it possible for her to skip censorship and give heated speeches about abortion and domestic violence, for instance. Before this TV show, well, she cannot escape the image of Brazil's sweetheart, even in Malu Mulher, as you can see in this picture. Before this TV show, divorce used to be censored on telenovelas and were only shown on North American series broadcast at the nine o'clock slot, as well on, as on plays on songs. However, the major telenovela heroines of the 1970s were already professional women who got over their disappointments and suffering through their work. Author Jeanette Claire, who is responsible for many successes on TV, declared in an interview that she was herself an independent working women, woman. In her stories, though, the happy ending evoked successful love stories. In Malu Mulher, however, the work was the issue under discussion. What is the meaning of work? What are the implications of having a career? And what inequalities do women face? During the 1970s, the fields of the advertising and marketing developed in Brazil, influenced by North American techniques. Most of the population was seen as a marginal market, while advertising focused on what they called middle classes, meaning classes A and B in their terms. Middle class was then a term used to define roughly 20% of the population. But Global TV knew that its audience also came from the masses, particularly from the 1980s on. High inflation and the lost decade for the economists, though, meant that the active market was restricted to white urban middle class people, and the consumer was and still is considered mainly to be the female audience seen as housewives. So when we an analyze the uh, audience uh, researches and market research, there is this category of housewife. Although they may, might also have a job, housewife is the word still used in Brazil for what is known now in, in the US as PGS, Principal Grocery Shopper, <laughs> <laughs> in North American market research. The point here is that in Brazil, consume is seen as feminine, okay? Now th that's why the word housewife is still there. During the 1970s and the 1980s, many, many telenovela authors saw maids as their main audience. Maids who lived in their employers' homes watched such stories in the evening during their leisure time. Telenovelas showed modern working women plus good mother, plus loving lover, plus beautiful and glamorous women as the main heroines but there were also plenty of maids and working class people <coughs> as secondary characters. Also, there was not much space for black actors, confined as they were to historical plots portraying the slavery period. I just gave the example of Escravizauda, one of the most 
well known. But even if Globo knew that its audience was not restricted to upper middle classes, advertisers did not consider lower middle classes or the working classes as their target. In the 1990s, a new focus on the working classes started to arise. Then Globo's strategy called Class C, né? C class. Then Globo's strategy was linked not only to showing a vague social reality, but also to promoting what was then called social merchandising, which means educational messages displayed in teledramas. This was a moment in history when TV producers publicly assumed that TV could influence society. Therefore, besides commercial advertising, Global decided it was time to promote social values, and it started to build a social marketing area with social complaints, fundraising for social projects, schools, NGOs, and so on, such as for those who are uh, uh, familiar, Criança Esperança, things like that. At that time, a series called Mulher, Woman, just like that, in the singular, was produced. Mulher was broadcast 20 years after Malu Mulher with the goal of replicating its success. While it was inspired by North American medical shows, the uh, North American medical TV shows, the plot, the plot concerned two gynecologists and the clinic they worked in in a story full of preventive care messages. Two female doctors, one in the 60s and the other in the her 30s were the heroines. Emmett's many births, consultation and exams, family issues and love stories. The series conveyed, conveyed messages about contraception, HIV prevention, early detection for cancer, and so on. Once again, dramatic conventions on the opposition of good and evil are clearly stated in, this, in these health messages. Both shows, Malu Mulher and Mulher, as well as many telenovelas, are not explicitly melodramatic, for they tend to find nuances on bilateral positions. But they are clear and direct regarding health messages. Those who are against the appropriate treatment are villains, as, as well as those who do not take care, care, take at according to what is considered pr appropriate preventive behavior and some unethical doctors who attack the heroines are also the villains. The drama need not, needs not to be too mellow in order to function as a moral message. The drama is also politically malleable enough to assume both a feminist point of view or a pedagogical health message. When comparing both TV shows, we see that the first one was more attuned to the feminist agenda and was presented in a, pe uh, in a pedag pedagogical way although it had its ambiguities. Malu was explicitly feminist in most et episodes, at least for that period in Brazil. Divorce had only been regula regulated two years before the teledrama was broadcast, and the series defended the idea that sex and orgasm were important for women, whether or not intercourse was associated with love. It also discussed marriage, abortion, and domestic violence and it portrayed homoerotic love in a positive light much before this theme appeared on telenovelas. In Mulher, 20 years lately though, heterosexual sex was already liberated for women, but abortion as woman's right was never defended. Homoeroticism was not discussed, and the focus on motherhood tended to be normative. Its focus <coughs> was, on, was on health and preventive care issues, including the use of condom and early detection for com for ca of cancer, as well as contraception. Mulher stressed the view of the private clinic with the latest treatment and technology. The public ambulatory, in the back, there was the private clinic, a very elegant house, and on the back of the private clinic, the public ambulatory, uh, working with SUS. The public ambulatory also served to criticize the state of public care in Brazil. Globus' official discourse on its own series stressed that it was not a pedagogical proposal per se, neither a channel for informative messages only. However, as each episode had clear health prevention messages, it could be seen as an emphatic application of the social merchandising project that took place in many telenovelas since the 1990s. It was also the space for polemic subjects, rape and sexual violence, abortion, 
euthanasia, domestic violence, alcoholism, sexual practice, and female orgasm. The approach was not necessarily feminist. For example, although helping and curing women with complications after unsafe abortions, the heroin doctors never argue in favor of changing le legislation, and they stress repeatedly the importance of modern techniques of contra contraception. Moreover, it promoted private clinics with all the newest technologies in image diagnosis, complex surgeries, and the latest medical equipments, even if they rarely advertised the pharmaceutical industrial industry, except Viagra once. In the end, it showcased most up-to-date equipments, which were only accessible to part of the population. At the same time, scenes in the public ambulatory portrayed lack of information among the working classes and problems in the public health system, including corruption. During this period, there was a public deba debate on the high rates of C-sections in Brazil. Since the 1990s, the health ministry was trying to promote vaginal births, stimulating the humanization of the birth movement. These initiatives were supported by the World Health Organization and the World Bank, with the support of NGOs and feminist groups. Professional medical associations were also active in the debate. In 1996, the federal government started a campaign which motto was Normal is Natural, in order to promote vaginal births. Although the TV show's content was not exactly attuned to the demands uh, concerning humanization, the heroin doctors emphasized the importance of natural births as the most legitimate alternative, leaving C-sections only to necessary or risky situations. In face of polarized positions, one defending medicalized model of birth in which C-sections were portrayed as safer alternative, and the other stressing humanized natural birth, the show did not mention the debate explicitly, but dialogued with the theme showing a somewhat intermediary position. This attempt to reconcile distinct political views, trying not to confront any of them directly, is typical of the political approach of teledramas on global. Even Malu Mulher tried that. That might happen because global produces for a mass audience, the whole country, and tries to please everybody in order to maintain its audience share. Mulher was not as daring or pioneering as Malu Mulher 20 years before, as feminist or left-wing political issues were not covered. Homosexuality, although present in telenovelas at the time Mulher was broadcast, were, was not discussed, nor was ra racism. Dr. Cree, Dr. Sorry, Dr. Chris, one of the protagonists, was a kind of Malu with a diverse trajectory. Her career goes well, Sexual freedom is already there, but what she looks for is real love. The happy ending is the birth of her twins, with the help of the other heroine, Dr. Mata, and the prospect of living with, but not in a traditional marriage, with Dr. João Pedro, who raises a daughter from his first marriage. The happy ending here is motherhood. It's not marriage, it's motherhood. If Malu Mulher was a pedagogy of the independent women, woman, Mulher stresses the pedagogy of healthcare in a somewhat post-feminist approach. By the end of the century, it doesn't seem relevant anymore to affirm a woman's autonomy or their right to, to pleasure. This seem to be taken for granted. But a new form of love is still a goal to be attained. Comparing the two TV shows, one can see how some themes are naturalized in teledrama. The importance of women's work, and the presence of female characters with an active heterosexual life, which is also pervasive in telenovelas in general. I'm, I chose two dramas, but I'm also talking about the telenovelas in this period. It is important to bear in mind that Brazilian television, under the pressure of advertisers, has focused mainly on urban, white, upper, and middle class people. Its imagined community, <laughs> community at least until the beginning of the 21st century, rarely portrayed blacks, lower classes, or rural areas. Globo knew its audience was larger than what its advertisers were focusing on, but fiction news and ads privileged the images of an affluent white Brazil. As Mankekar has also noted for Indian television, which privileged Hindus, or Laila Bulagud has noted in Egypt, 
Brazilian teledramas make us assume that the rest of the population will identify with that very partial focus. That means blacks will identify with white heroines, as they do. Television conveyed a certain lifestyle, the inspiration of which came from a small segment of the population as a model for the nation. And surely it was also teaching the logic of a consumerist society to the whole population. After Lula's government, when income distribution programs such as Bolsa Familia and also with the so-called new C-class, there is a cogn recognition in Brazil that lower classes or people living in favelas are also consumers. This goes hand in hand, of course they were consumers before, but <laughs> this goes hand in hand with the World, World Bank's praise of the new middle class expansion among the BRICS. However, Hedge Globus is still mainly white in its dramas. Medical settings tend to favor high-tech equipments and interventions, as in Mulher. Advertisers and major companies still re resist putting black actors on commercials. The presence of black actors is almost limited to official ads from state or federal government, or it is limited to an advertising of Brazilianness through soccer or carnival, as in beer commercials. Advertisers do not want to associate their brands with the new ascending middle class, for those are still considered ugly in their terms, which is often a euphemism for non-whites in Brazil. Nor do they want to associate their brands with the precariousness of favelas. Global TV knows that its audience is not restricted to upper middle class, but it has to negotiate with its main clients, the advertisers. Thank you. Well, thank you to the organizer for inviting me, and thank you for three wonderful presentations. I'm going to try to say something useful for the discussion, and I'll be brief. Um, I thought that, that one way of beginning was uh, to go back to the title and try to see how that sequence of terms and concepts work, uh, works in relation to the three presentations. Uh, I think that could be illuminating. We can see that there are many connections between the terms. That they are not all of them discussed in each of the papers. And also, you, we can see different sequences of meaning according to each presentation. Uh, so let's begin with health. Um, in the three uh, papers, we see uh, that health appears as a practice that has to do with treatment or interpretation of, of pathologies and also appears as different forms of pathology. Mental illness, in the first case, reproductive health, in the case of Eloisa's paper. And in the case, in John's case, uh, I thought that even though it's not addressed directly, uh, there is a reference to pain and traumatic memory that would be maybe a way of thinking about pathology and illness in that case. Um, and this seems to be very clear, but then it becomes immediately complicated because we see that both illness and health are problematic and unstable concepts in each of these papers. Um, there are different forms of reading health and normalcy and anomaly or abnormality. And there are different forms of reading the body and the relationship between the body as a physical and material entity and something that exceeds the body. And that something that exceeds the body could be the mind, or could be the spirit. Um, the access to that, that that cannot be properly named, uh, the access uh, happens or works through science and language. Um, and then, then we see people trying to read the excess of movement in the first paper, uh, people trying to read um, or to interpret um, pain in, 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 the, in the case of the evangelicals and, and singing. But we can also see anthropologists and professional critics trying to read these people through testimonies, through testimonials, and through interviews, uh, or through witnesses, witnesses, witnessing particular practices. Uh, we can also see. Um, uh, different ways of institutional forms of approaching disease. Religion, um, medicine, 
and also technology. No, in the case of the telenovelas, technology is appears on uh, on display. Um, and in the case of the of the women uh, who suffer from an excess of women, we can also see uh, that, that there, there are different uh, institutional ways of approaching those diseases. The next term is the city, and we see Sao Paulo, Salvador, uh, and then a virtual space, that is the TV space, the media space. And once we pay attention to the role of the cities in each of the presentations, we immediately realize that each of the cities uh, organizes its space in a different way. Sao Paulo is no Sao Paulo because uh, we are immediately uh, thinking through religion. Uh, we are introducing to an international, transnational space that is the space of evangel uh, the evangelicals and international blackness. In the case of El Salvador, the city is immediately <coughs> organized according to different regions and areas defined by race and class and culture, I would say. And the TV, even though it's produced in the city and projects an urban imagination, um, also has to do with the idea of an imagined community that transcends that space and has to do, to do with the idea of a modern Brazil, maybe, of, uh, or mother society beyond Brazil. Next one is difference. We see race as an opposition between uh, white and black. Uh, but that also there is a tension between what I see as Brazilian blackness and North American uh, blackness, or African blackness, or trans-African uh, blackness. Then we also see difference as gender, um, the, con the tension between women and men, but also between black women and uh, black men. So it's, there is a combination of gender and race. Uh, there is another difference marked by the tension between modern and non-modern. Uh, especially in the case of Salvador, and between scientific, uh, sci scientific and <coughs> cultural or religious, um, or, and cultural re or religion. Rights. Uh, I see at least two uh, ways of discussing rights in the presentation. One has to do with black rights in the context of uh, the Brazilian modern nation or the modern state, and women's rights. And finally, belonging. This is a tricky one. <laughs> uh, in, the, in itself, it's a tricky one, and it's a tricky one uh, to discuss in the context of the trade presentation. But I thought that in Miriam's uh, presentation, there were conflicting forms of belonging and of self um, understanding no? in terms religion, religious terms, in terms of family, in terms of gender. In the case of um, Eloisa's presentation on the telenovela, there was an attempt to talk about belonging in terms of class and gender, uh, especially in, uh, upper middle class uh, Brazilian women or middle class women. And in very clearly, in the case of John's presentation, we saw that belonging was connected to, um, to, to religion, and the combination of religion and blackness through singing, which I thought uh, was uh, very interesting. Well, that would be more or less my map. There, are, uh, I wanted just to reconstruct possible ways of linking those terms. And I think that there are many <coughs> questions and interesting discussions in relation to those sequences. And then I have a few questions for each of them, or maybe one question, just so I, I can open the floor. Um, in the case of, of, of media, and I was wondering, what was the, the role of power in the case of the religious institutions, of the religious community, religious communities, and what was the role of community politics? Um, I thought that maybe it was a little optimistic to think of these women as empowered women who are able to develop new trajectories or new forms of movement. The source of the disease is the excess of movement. And I thought that there were different agents. The mothers were trying to figure out what they had, the, the, I guess the, the religious um, leaders were trying to figure out what they had. I didn't see, at least not in the version that I read, I didn't see um, that there was only one, these women were completely autonomous agents. And some of, the, some of the cases also referred to power problems within the religious communities. 
And I thought, and also thought that I was, it was interesting that these communities have different institutional formations trying to decipher the body and trying to decipher disease, uh, scientific, religious, <coughs> very particular way. So that will be my question. The question for uh, John, and I'm sorry I haven't uh, read your book yet, but I will. <laughs> uh, my question, may, maybe that is discussed in the book, but it wasn't in the paper. Uh, I wanted to know more about the role of language and translation, because you refer to gospels in English, and um, in a, uh, there is an autobiography that one of the, the women uh, read, but the title is in English, so I was wondering, there is a Portuguese version. And uh, do they sing in English? Uh, or they translate into Portuguese? And if there was something there um, um, in relation to be belonging and blackness. And finally, uh, for um, Eloisa, the question I had uh, is an audience. Um, since the TV here is working as a way of constructing an imagined community in the sense of Anderson, but through TV, uh, mm -hmm. through the media, I was wondering, if most, in, in all those decades, the families that were portrayed uh, were uh, middle class families or middle class women, I was wondering how it was um, received by a population, probably even though there were no black people in the telenovelas, there were black people in the audience. So I was wondering if they accepted these models of behavior or not, if there is that, that data about that, and finally, I wanted to know if the consumerism side, advertisement, was also re was or not related to health issues. Um, because since the women were doctors, uh, if that some of the products that th they were trying to sell had to do with women's reproductive health. And those are my questions. <laughs> Thank you so much for rich presentations, uh, terrific comments. And now we want to open up so, so, that, so you can collect your thoughts about the question of power, language translation, and audience. So while they, while they uh, collect their thoughts, we'll select uh, some questions and we have two rounds. I already had Bruno, Bridget, <coughs> Rome, Pedro, Marcia, we. <laughs> we condensed. You know, I'm always more convinced than I could be. Ah, okay. <laughs> you guys are in enough trouble with the comments. There's already so much there, and it sounds like it would be a, a barrage of more comments. Questions, which is a sign of how, how wealthy and rich and suggested all of the, all of the four um, talks were. One is, um, it's nice to hear, it's great to hear the, the literary scholar reflect. We keep talking about how language matters from all types of different perspectives. And we did reflect about the progression of these concepts. So I suppose we must say that health in the city part was meant to evoke sex in the city. <laughs> um, so returning to language, uh, and uh, I'm glad that I'm kind of is, is here. Um, I, I think, John, one oblique opening uh, through which I think uh, uh, we can link health to, 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 to your material, your research, your reflection, is the shared etymology of salvation and salud, mm. Mm. which is mm. certainly not direct, it just occurred to me. Mm. And uh, there, there are a lot of vectors here, and I, I, I want to introduce many more. I'll introduce one uh, other one that I'd like to hear you guys speak more about, uh, which is just a question of, of, of space and scale. And one of the wonderful things with Eloise's research is this idea of the city penetrating people's homes in rural areas, etc., etc. Um, and uh, a median's reflection was very concerned with space in many ways, with uh, the itineraries and walking, etc. But I wanted to hear more about architecture, kind of places and spaces we're talking about, care, and worship, etc. And I'll leave it at that. Can you bridge it? Um, I also want to thank all four of you. This was wonderful, and the, your papers just spoke to each other in really interesting ways. Um, but I had a question for John about, um, in the early part of your paper, where Priscilla is dramatizing this um, kind of inner monologue between the devil and, and God, where the devil is basically um, shaming her in this distinctively gendered way. And so you say it's kind of like an internalization of church discourses about the role of women and how they shouldn't be you know, in front of people. Um, but I was wondering if first, whether there might be something um, 
something novel or, or even quite radical about the ways in which that discourse gets consolidated and articulated and then put in the mouth of the devil. Um, so it seems like there's a kind of a sort of objectification there. I'm thinking of Webb Keen and Gary Fire, but there's a lot of resonance there. Um, and then second, um, how after that, that voice is placed in the person of the devil, it enables her to switch to this, what seems to my ears, this hyper-masculine um, language of battle, combat, um, armor, fighting, war. So I just, I, I wanted to ask you maybe about if, if you thought about that potential, that potentially radical reading of this. Yeah, I have a question for John and for Eloise as well. And also, thank you all for the very insightful lectures. John, I may be, perhaps I may, I may be unfair with you. And if so, I apologize even before I make the question. But I did have the impression to listen to you while rendering Priscilla's statements, Diego's statements, Martha's statements, a sort of a, sort of a deliberate ironic detachment. Mm -hmm. And I think that sometimes when we deal with the evangelical movement, we allow ourselves to have this ironic detachment without reflecting upon its consequences for an anthropolo anthropological work. And then I sensed, I missed the two points in your lecture, but again, you could not read the section, of poli the political section, perhaps it was there. Mm -hmm. Is that actually Priscilla's statements are not Priscilla's statements. They are rhetorical devices. One of the main, most important novelties of the evangelical movement in Brazil, the evangelical movement is providing a language, a world view, and the rhetorical devices for people in Brazil that never had any sense of belonging, did not have education, did not have any networks of solidarity, which the evangelical movement provides. So the main rhetorical device employed by Priscilla, Marta, the other, it doesn't matter if it is male or female, it is, if you may, a miraculous multiplication of personal stories, of forms of redemption. This is the main rhetorical device of the evangelical movement. There is always a story of <coughs> form and then redemption. And I think that uh, this is a very important point that I think, at least in your presentation, I have not heard the linguistic dimension and the fact that the evangelical movement is providing a language and a worldview with very specific rhetorical devices. This is the point that you usually will overlook. The second point is that uh, the gospel music is business. It's above all business. It's very common now in Brazil that former popular singers that went out of the public favor, they went through very public process of conversion, and then they become gospel singers. Mm -hmm. And so the evangelical movement in Brazil is creating cities within the Brazilian polis. They have a political project. They have alternative job markets. They provide a sense of social security that Brazil as a state never provided. So I think that those two dimensions, I, at least I did not listen to your presentation. If I'm unfair, I apologize. <laughs> you know, it's a very, very quick question. I have the impression that sometimes in Brazil, we attribute to network growth a protagonism, which it does not have. I think that we do it because we project our anxieties on network global. And we say, network global is all white. So we are. The Brazilian guests of this conference are all white. And I would like to listen to you about the growing of the Hackwood network, the, the evangelical network, and whether or not it will challenge, or if it is challenging, the hegemony of the global network. Great. 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 Uh, well, uh, thank you all for the wonderful panel. Um, <laughs> I have a question to me, and me and I had read your paper, and it's even more beautiful now than I heard from you. Um, it's a question about the closeness. Uh, I was struck by the closeness between evangelization and, and Afro Brazilian condom black. There is something that I Somehow I'll go back to the language question that is over in here. Uh, it's about Pentecostalism in, in its biblical sense. I mean, the moment in which you hear you speak languages in the plural. I, I was really uh, curious about uh, which, what kind of language is being uh, spoken there. What, what can you hear? What kind of Portuguese is that? What kind of Afro Brazilian Portuguese is that? Uh, and also a question that is for you and perhaps John, I mean, it's, it's about trance, uh, which is not, I think, a word that really appeared as 
hard to remember. But it's it's all about actually a, a, a taken subject and the whole liberal concept of a subject that is in, in control of, of his own mind or her own mind is, is in question once you talk about that. But it's, at the same time, it's clear in your presentation, uh, John, that there is a battle about this control over mind, or body, spirit, and self-control, regaining control for the body and the soul, and, and you genderize that somehow. This is interesting. And for Louisa, I have a very, uh, I'm very curious to hear you about this uh, sort of opening end of your presentation when you talk about the Lula era and the, this sort of resistance to the acceptance of the, those new characters. And this goes back to actually Sean Cesar's uh, teasing question uh, about uh, this C-class. I mean, uh, is it true that it's not, the C-class is not in advertising and telegrams? I mean, where is it from? Because they, they are consumers, so mm -hmm. they must be some, the market is not blind or bad. Or bad. Okay. Um. To address Gabriela's question, uh, first I, I should say I was not really talking about the formation of autonomous agents that, that would like be completely freed from, from power structures. That, that was not really my point. And if we, if we take Candomblé and, and Pentecostal churches, I mean Candomblé, the head of Candomblé have strongly hierarchical communities and when somebody is initiated to the Tejero, he has to endure a lot of, of um, th there are many demands placed on that person. He can't or she can't stand up in front of her seniors. She has to do a lot of, of housework in the Tejero. So, I mean, there, there's a whole process which is called in Canoble making the person. And it's, it's a long process. It's very difficult for many people. And, and, and this is a process from which emerges not an autonomous agent, but really a, a, an agent that's more connected, that's more linked in, in various different ways. I, I don't think we have to think um, a, a power and the formation of agents as contradictory terms. I really like the way Saba Mahmoud worked this, this Foucaultian idea of the, the relation between power, the exercise of power, and the formation of agency. And she, so she, she starts with, with Foucault to argue that the exercise of power actually is one of the conditions for the formation of agents because that produces the docile body, the body that is malleable enough to, to, in, to learn and incorporate ability. So I don't think we have to think of these things, formation of agents and exercise of power, as necessarily contradictory. So uh, yeah, I, I, was, I didn't really have time to talk about to talk much about the, the, the institutional formations, but the same, the same happens in Pentecostal churches. I, I, I think that when I described Anais, Anaïsa's case, it, you, you can also see that, you know, that she's being monitored all the time by, by the pastor and by the, 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 the sisters, the, the obreras, the, the way she has to behave, her body <coughs> postures. So this is, this is also, power being exercised directly on her body and forming a specific type of, of agency, and which is not really the autonomous individual agent, but also, again, the agent that's more connected and that's intensified through the Holy Spirit. And coming to, to the connection between um, Afro-Brazilian and, and Pentecostalism, that, that really struck me because um, so I, I didn't do much field work in Pentecostal churches. I did some. I did more field work in, in the Candomblé, but I have many students who are doing field work in Pentecostal churches. And sometimes I would go to them to the field, and, and we would observe people that, that were receiving the Holy Spirit. And at first look, it, it just seemed like somebody that was having a first experience of, of receiving a caboclo in, in the Candomblé. And sometimes in, in these churches, um, the, the pastor would, would say things like, um, Come call me, you know, to try to calm down the Holy Spirit, the way, the way <laughs> you see things happening in the Hedu Jikadomblai. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of influence, of act because people do move a lot. I mean, this is something that we, we have to, to keep in mind, you know. There, there's a lot of transit between religions, and that, that's, that's a strong part of people's experience. So we can't really think of these things as, you know, isolated worlds. People are moving all the time. And, and this does have an impact on, on those religions as well. Um, about trance and about the, the suggestion of, of um, 
uh, building a, a stronger dialogue with neurosciences. Uh, actually, I, I think it's, it's interesting, but I think it has to be done in a very cautious way because the problem is that if we, the problem is that we can't start doing that from a separation that would say, you know, the neurosciences will be talking about the physical, the body, the material, and, and social sciences will be talking about interpretation, context, because then, you know, we we're starting from a point of view that's already <coughs> separating the, the, the cult culture as, as meaning and just superposed to, to body or, you know. The, so I think in order to, to proceed in that direction, there has to be, it can't just be adding up. It has to be more, more serious, more committed, or I don't know, something that. So I think a lot of work would be required there. You know, also, you would need neuroscientists that are more attuned as well to, to questions of, 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 um, of anthropology, social sciences, etc. And the problem with the concept of trans, that this has been there have been various anthropologists <coughs> making comments on that it has to do with the fact that usually trans there's the, 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 the pair trans in possession so trans is the, the neurological alteration the physical uh, and possession is the cultural interpretation that comes on top of, of the, the, the trans concept and again that's there's a big problem there so I think there's something we have to be cautious about um, about Latour, I, th I think that, that the interesting thing about Latour that, that really motivated me is the idea that a body has to be understood as a trajectory. A body has to be understood as an itinerary of learning. So you, a body is a process of learning to be affected. And death is just the opposite, is when you stop being affected. So I think this, is, this was very interesting to look at the, what, what, what was happening to people in religions, the how bodies were learning to be affected. And then adding this to the second idea he presents, which is, which is really interesting, is that this is a process that also produces worlds that are more differentiated, that are more varied. So I think this, this was just a perfect way to, to, to approach the, the religious therapies. But go basically, that's it. That's great. John? Sure. Yeah, um, I think it's a fantastic. Uh, questions. Let me, uh, I, I'll start with the language. Uh, Gabriela's, and I think uh, I came from the multitudes as well. Um, I'm very mindful of the fact that, you know, in this context, as in most others in Brazil, the English language has a, uh, a, a history and an imperial history and a colonial history. And the irony of this is that uh, in this context, in spite of how this is often understood or seen, there's a very powerful decolonizing uh, impulse and dynamic and an anti-imperialist one that is actually very powerful because it's respectful of English and it has been able to detach itself from the power of English so that it's turning it around. Uh, in, in performances, there'll be one <coughs> sort of we're going to now sing one spiritual in English because that's the root, but now we're going to be singing all the gospel that we write, that we produce, because Portuguese, after all, is the language of God. I mean, we know that God is Brazilian. And so the universalizing claims of English have been turned on their head. And uh, in my feeling, very much that universalizing power is appropriated into black gospel and there's a kind of liberation that's happening here. So there's certainly English is present, there's this interesting relationship with it, but there's not a sense of submission or subordination, because there really is you know, a, a lot of, most of the writing uh, of the, the, uh, the songs and the music is, is Brazilian, um, and the lyrics are Brazilian. So there, there is the singing of some in English as a kind of a nod to history and then moving on. Um, so that, I don't know if that addresses it a little bit. Um, in terms of the, the question about space, I think is really fascinating because, you know, uh, what this kind of music is about is uh, forging new spaces and not being restricted inside of the space of the church. There's a lot of singing in church and there's a lot of singing in open spaces and in public <coughs> squares and in the street and in, you know, the various 
sort of creating those to reach to the world because that's part of the, you know, the mission is, you know, the great mission is to go forth and convert all of, you know, all humanity. And so the architecture is the architecture of the world in a way. That being said, there's a very interesting understanding of the space of the church as there are certain uh, spaces that are more and more sacred, even though that's often uh, alien to the at least ideological notion of the evangel of, of the gospel that all space is sacred. There's a sense of, of unevenness. So that um, black gospel based in blues spiritual, you know, spirituals and blues is okay all the way in the, in the inner sanctum and on Sundays, but you don't bring in um, <coughs> rap and you don't bring in samba. That is, you can have those in the in the public spaces and the annexes and outside, but to bring it in on those days and those spaces still taboo. So it's interesting. The black gospel does get to the sort into the center architecturally from that point of view. Um, <coughs> I'm, I'm saddened to think, I mean, that I, that what it sounds like is that I have ironic detachment since my struggle over the last 25 years has been to not have that. Um, it's very Christian, you know, the good you want to do, no, <laughs> you <laughs> never do. <laughs> this began some, about 20 years ago when I was working on an earlier project on, uh, Looking for God in Brazil, and I came to pre present the results to a Pentecostal church, and I was so proud that I had done the analysis, and I was giving the testimonies, and I was analyzing the gender struggles and this, and and the class dimensions, and because the pastor had, had welcomed me into the assembly to do this, and the, the woman raised her hand in the back, and she says, "So you're saying that we're here because we have problems." Oh my, that, that, that's, that is what sort of the sociological imagination has generated, and there's no bridge. And since that moment, I thought, no, I, I have to be able to do something else. And if I fail to do that here, then that's, that's on me. And, but, it's, but I agree with you that that's the project, is to not um, have that irony, and, you know, but to have deep, abiding respect and it shows that I have more work to do in my internal spiritual battle. Uh, I, I couldn't agree more that th these are these are rhetorical devices. I think of rhetoric as as a interface between the, the material and the spiritual, and so I see that as exactly what's going on here, and that is empowering and enabling. Um, I hope that nothing I said here makes it seem that I think of these of anybody as a victim or disempowered. Um, gospel is a business, but I think it's all a business. What I think is really interesting is the generation at the local level of all sorts of other dynamics that are not just about business. Uh, from you know the crews on the street who are doing happy you know um, uh, happy gospel to the choirs that form spontaneously because they just need to be singing in this way. Uh, clearly, they're listening to Kirk Franklin. They're listening to Cedric Sass. They're listening, but there's but there's something there, and I think that for us to I mean, I don't think that's what you're implying, but to reduce that to a kind of a, an effect of a system uh, that's mainly about the material and power, I, I think is not it impoverishes or, or it doesn't allow us to understand why this tr has traction, and I'm trying to get to that. Like, where the meanings are, as Emily Dickinson has asked us to do. And uh, last two, two more points, the, the political dimension, I didn't get to it, actually I have a whole two chapters of that about that in, in the book, and thinking about how, how the kinds of patterns of worldview that I've tried to map here have political effects, the one that I would draw attention to is in constructing uh, new models of being church. And the, so the men think about wanting to build a church that is led by, by negros. I mean, they're thinking about creating Maikereja Negera and thinking about themselves as occupying positions of leadership. The women are fine with that, but you know, that's not the real driving. But what they want is 
what we have now in these churches, let's start on Sunday schools, let's start talking about the role of, of uh, Africans in the Bible. Let's start reforming what we have. We don't have to create a whole new institution. We have to start reforming this. And so there's a lot of interesting things to be said about that. And then, uh, I, was, I don't want to go into neuroscience. I love neuroscience. I want to learn more about it. I actually think that I agree completely with me again. Uh, but we do need to understand theta waves and beta waves and alpha waves. And if we don't, we're lost, because I think that there's something real going on here. Um, that being said, I don't want to, I think we need to develop synthetic ways of looking at, at these things. Um, last thing, I, there was one other thing. There's so much you guys the devil's know. Agency. That's enough. What? The devil's agency. How, how, how the radical critique that the devil might allow this woman to produce was a previous question. Well, I, I love the fact that, <clears throat> you know, um, well, two things. One is, that's what I thought I was saying. Uh, but even if, but if I wasn't, then there's enough there to articulate that. And I think that that's, I, mean, I agree with that. that. I, mean, I think that you're right. That's exactly what's going on here. And the, it, there is this objectification. But I take the point. But as soon as we go down that line, I don't want to get ironic about it. I want to be able to be to do justice to that experience as something other than a pure projection or objectification. Because she's dealing with a, with something. She's dealing with this externality. It's not just, oh, we really know that the voice is her subconscious and so on. Uh, that may be so, and yet if I go down that line, then I'm dealt, I'm, I still don't have an answer for the woman who stands up at the back of the church and says, you mean basically we're here because we have problems. So, Lisa, thank you so much for your, for your uh, John's now. Let's wrap it up with Lisa's comments. Address quickly some three or four questions together: the issue of audience, of globalist protagonists, of class C. They are all linked together, in a way. Well, first, I started studying audience, uh, audience ethnography. That's how I started studying Theron Panas in Brazil. I did an audience study at, in, in, during the nineties with a telenovela called O Rei do Gado in a small town, not a small, middle-sized town in Brazil, and, and how people relate to that and how the power of global and how can we think. And in fact, most of the people I did research is now what is called Class C, so I can put all, all things together. Um, the thing is, for in my point of view, there was a lot, a lot of criticism con concerning uh, global's powerful political uh, uh, capacity of, pay, uh, of being a political actor in terms of opinions in Brazil. You know, yeah. especially during the, the 80s, the 70s, and the 80s, the greatest part of bibliography of sociologists thinking about global would say that. How I feel is that. Global is much, much more powerful in terms of promoting consumption, not in, in promoting political views. That's how I feel. Because how I feel is that um, people do not accept immediately what they see on TV. They react to that. They have their own opinions. But what is most repetitive, as women working outside, as the, the, the promotion of consumption, this is what changed society. This is the powerful side of telenovelas or of TV, what, what they repeat year after year, not the, 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 a single moment, not, not one single Journal National editing makes people change their mind, but the, the continuous process is what, is what makes uh, people change their mind. And so people watch telenovela, they criticize telenovela, they see a lack of black people, especially black families would say that to me, uh, but even though they love it, and even though they identify with the main characters, with certain and certain characters. Since the 1970s, all telenovelas have the black, uh, the, uh, not necessarily the black, but the poor nucleus and the rich nucleus. All, uh, and, and the best story is the poor girl will marry the rich girl, you know that. Than the rich boy, you know that. <laughs> <laughs> that's the main story. That's, that's how you solve class con conflict in, in those telenovelas. Uh, the, the poor will, 
will get married to the rich and that, and that solves everything. Of course, that, that is there. Nevertheless, even if you look, even nowadays, Avenida Brasil, how they portray the favelas, look at those houses and compare to the houses of real poor people. It's not the same. So people watch telenovelas and the, the first thing they, they, when they watch, one thing they used to say, I wish I had a house like this. <laughs> I wish I had a house. Even middle class people said to me, I wish I had a house like poor people in telenovelas. <laughs> because the poor houses in telenovelas is much better than my middle class house. <laughs> much larger, with much more comfort, with much more equipment, and so on. So since then, telenovela, since then, telenovela is showing a consumerist urban lifestyle, even when, telenove even when it's a rural telenovela. It may be said, hey do gado, in the rural areas, but it's showing an urban lifestyle. I, I cannot ex escape <laughs> seeing that happening. And, and um, there's I was going to say something else that escaped. And even if you think about declining fertility, I took part in a, in a, in a, in a group of that also. So um, the thing is, I, I, how I feel is that declining fertility has much more to do with showing a consumerist lifestyles where you have to give things to your children than what is the size of the family in telenovelas per se. Um, because in sometimes telenovelas, they have huge families as well. And they all live together in the same house. Very rich families living in this, this mansion. Because it's make easier to show the conflicts. You know, it's a plot, it's a plot <laughs> matter, not a realistic yeah. matter. And um, um, so since then, and Global knows its main audience. That's why author says, some author says, my main audience are maids, you know. They know that, they know that their audiences are classy. But when you interview, when you, when I analyzed a, a magazine Global has made, which was called Mercado Global, it doesn't exist anymore. It stopped in to, uh, 2008. But it, it started in 1974 and analyzed all those years. And they focus all the market research they do with classes A and B until 2008. After Bolsa Familia, after Lula's government, and so on. So advertisers, and I interview a lot of uh, advertising professionals as well, and, 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 and they say when they have uh, focus groups as market research, they say uh, the announcer, the, the, the big companies, they don't want to see blacks in those focus groups. Mm -hmm. Because blacks are poor, are ugly. And they don't want to put blacks in advertisers, of course. There is, but then you can say, there is Casas Bahia advertising on TV. Right, you're right. There are advertisers that know that lower class people also consume and that are, are directed to them. But if you watch uh, the prime time telejournal, uh, Jornal Nacional and the main telenovelas, the larger uh, advertisers, you know, they focus on white people. You just watch TV. It's very common when, uh, when we receive foreign uh, um, academics in Brazil, most of them ask me, why is Brazilian TV so white? They ask me because they have a different pattern of, uh, of TV in their mind. <coughs> we are so used in Brazil that we don't see this anymore. But, uh, and it still is, of course, there are some changes, little changes. You can say, ah, Avenida Brasil changed something. Well, maybe, yes, but uh, you know, not that much, not that much. The whole point is that the, the whole power is in, 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 in consuming. And how the audience uh, react, well, they react, they negotiate. But at the same time, the, the, less, the less formal education the person has, the more she feels she's informed through TV, she learns through TV. The more educated, the less you valorize TV as information. You know that. You have those feelings already. Um, record. TV record does not work as a cultural industry per se, because the uh, SBT inter. That means they are not, uh, they cannot, uh, the revenues do, do not come from advertisers. They cannot sustain the, the, their production with advertising only. You know? So record gets money from the church. SBT gets money from Telecena, from Silvio Santos, other, other enterprises. 
and Globo is the only, up to now, Globo is the only uh, open TV channel that knows how to deal with advertisers, that uh, uh, knows how to um, answer their clients' <laughs> demands and things like that. So when I was studying before, for example, some programs in SBT that, that has high, high audience rates had difficult in finding advertisers. Why was that? Because largest advertisers didn't want to associate the, their brand pro images, their product images, with, pro uh, with Hachinho, for example, with Datena, for example, which is very popular violent TV shows. They don't want to associate their brands with such programs. And Global has a, a, a better image in terms of that. Um, um, so I'm always closing, right just a little. Uh, so there is something changing with the Class C, but even now, uh, even though there are problems in finding advertisers going uh, that want to spend their money with the uh, 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 advertising for Class C in TV Global because TV Global is very expensive. Of course, some, some of those smaller advertisers might go to SBT, might go to Record, might go to other, uh, other uh, places. And um, I, I won't have time to say everything, but um, uh, Global has its main revenues from selling, from, from broadcasting in Brazil. The, the selling abroad is much less important for, for Global. You know, it's something that keeps its image abroad, but it's not something that really uh, sustain the company. And uh, of course, they are uh, they are selling. It's uh, what I think it's the most visible influence is on uh, Angola and Mozambique, mm -hmm. where people really watch Brazilian telenovelas, learning uh, urban styles, uh, Brazilian way of speaking Portuguese and uh, admiring something in Brazil. I think there's, there's some place, of course, there was Escravizaura that was uh, um, um, exported to, even to China, Cuba, and everything. But it's not always that, such, uh, that telenovelas have such success abroad. Oh, uh, there are many more comments I couldn't answer really, but. Guys, to be continued, this was <laughs> terrific, wonderful. Thank you all.